So I picked this bio example specifically because it looks like it is really complicated at face value. You know, just look at the figure right here. Um, but a, there are a lot of passages on the MCAT that you're going to encounter that are, you know, they're, they're going to look insane. You're going to see biochemical pathways with enzymes that you've never seen before. You're going to see some molecular biology with all these um, other enzymes that you've never seen before. And I, I don't want you to panic. It's They throw these at you, but it's kind of like fluff. Um, you just need to kind of extract what you need out of every passage. You're not going to need all that information to, to solve the problems. But you're going to have to get used to you know cutting out the unnecessary stuff and focusing on the meat, on the point. You know, the, I, I like to think that the entire MCAT is actually a verbal exam. It's all critical reading, even in the physics and chemistry section. So um, you, you just want to pull out what's important out of every passage and then use what you know, those facts, link them to your content review that you did for whatever, five, six weeks, and then use those to solve the problem. All right? So this passage says, sympathetic nerve terminal receptor junctions are located within visceral organs, glands, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Norepinephrine, which we know is a, um, a neurotransmitter that's used in the sympathetic nerv nervous system, right? Released from the nerve terminal interacts with either alpha or beta adrenergic receptors, okay? And here is a figure that describes that. So this is a typical, you know, nerve terminal um, setup right here, right? And then, so basically, you know how it goes. You have um, an axis potential travels down the axon of a neuron. Once it reaches a synaptic terminal that, um, you know, raises, depolarizes the voltage-gated calcium channels, that allows cal calcium to flood in to the, um, to the, the, you know, the bulb at the end of the axon, and then those calcium ions will bind to receptors, which will allow the re receptors to fuse with the uh, membrane of the synaptic cleft, and um, then you will they, they will excito exocytose their materials out into the synaptic cleft, and then the neurotransmitter will do its thing. It'll bind to receptors, stuff like that, um, and then you ha need to have a mechanism to get rid of that neurotransmitter. And so that's where you have reuptake, which is occurring right here, right? The norepinephrine is being transported back into the presynaptic neuron, right? It's being reuptake taken, and that gets broken down, looks like, by MAO, right? And then, you know, it can get repackaged and stuff like that and then come back to this region when it's ready to be sent out again, right? And then whatever is left, I'm assuming, um, is broken down by something else, COMT, okay? It's very simple. Right, so Sant, you know, it looked like it was crazy, but you just got to apply what you know about neurons, action potential, stuff like that, um, neurotransmitters, and then now this picture is very simple, right? Okay, so let's move on. So adrenergic, uh, recept adrenergic drugs mimic activation of the sympathetic nervous system by stimulating adrenergic receptors. Okay, that's pretty obvious. An adrenergic drug may interact directly with adrenergic receptors by binding to them or indirectly by making more of the neurotransmitter available to them. After its release, norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft is inactivated primarily by active transfer back into the nerve terminal. That's what we're talking about with reuptake. Where it is either broken down by monoamine oxid oxidase, okay, or sequestered into vesicles. That makes sense. So either broken down or it's taken up by some vesicles where it can't, you know, stimulate the postsynaptic neuron again. Any norepinephrine not taken up is broken down by catecholomethyltransferase, all right, COMT. So that's basically it. So I don't want you to start panicking with all these names. Um, it's very simple, right? We have monoamine ox oxidase, which breaks down the, the neurotransmitter in the presynaptic neuron, so that'd be up here. And then you have COMT, which will break down whatever is left in the synaptic cleft. Okay. The relative numbers of alpha and beta receptors vary between tissues and determine how the tissues will respond to norepinephrine and or adrenergic drugs. Beta adrenergic responses occur in tissues in which beta receptors predominate. Typical beta responses include increased blood glucose concentration and dilation of blood vessels. 
supplying deep muscles and internal organs. And we know that both of those, you know, the passage didn't have to say that for us to know because we know that norepinephrine is a sympathetic neurotransmitter and these are very typical uh, sympathetic responses, right? Increased blood glucose, dilation of vessels, stuff like that, fight or flight. Alpha, alpha adrenergic responses occur in tissues in, in which alpha receptors predominate. Typical alpha adrenergic responses include widening of the pupils and constriction of the blood vessels supplying the skin and mucous membranes. Okay, so it looks like basically the sympathetic responses are split between these alpha expressing uh, neurons and these beta expressing neurons, okay? Or tissues, I'm sorry, I meant tissues. Okay, so that makes sense, right? Okay, so let's move on to the questions. A compound that inhibits monoamine oxidase, MAO, should have which of the following effects on NE concentration? Okay, so if MAO breaks down NE, okay, so whenever MAO is working, you get low NE, right? So that means if you stop MAO from working, you're going to increase NE, right? That's pretty simple. Okay, so we're going to knock out C and D right away. Okay, so let's just strike these two out because we know that NE is going to increase, okay? So now the difference between A and B is where it happens, okay? So we're just going to go back to our picture right here. Where is MAO acting? It's not acting in the um, extra neuronal space, right? It's acting in the intraneuronal space. It's within the neuron. You don't have any MAO out here as far as we know, right? So then we can pick B as the answer. All right. Which of the following processes is least directly influenced by adrenergic drugs? Okay, so this passage actually tells us some, it gives us examples, it reminds us what sympathetic responses are. So I don't know if you're usually going to see that uh, within the passage, but it's nice that it's there. So, but we know generally that um, fight or flight responses like to inhibit digestion, um, they like to dilate the pupils, dilate blood vessels that go to the muscles, but constrict them in other areas that are not necessarily necessary for the fight or flight response, like uh, digestive um, tissues, right? So we know that things that are going to be affected definitely are things that are related to digestion and things that are related to the fight or flight, okay? So peristalsis, that's going to be inhibited, right? That's Peristalsis is a digestive function, okay? B, secretion of digestive enzymes, that's also going to be affected. You're going to get dec decrease of that. C, says enzymatic breakdown of food molecules. I'm not necessarily sure if those drugs could affect that. Enzyme is there, so if the enzyme's there, it's going to be doing its thing. I don't, I don't think uh, these enzymes would be expressing those receptors. That wouldn't make any sense, right? So enzymes don't, don't express uh, receptors like that. That would respond to neurotransmitters in this specific scenario, right? So C is looking like a good answer. D, nutrient delivery to muscles and organs. Mm, so if you think about the sympathetic response, you're probably going to have much more nutri nutrient offloading to muscles. I mean, that's just a given, right? If you're going to have increased dilation of blood vessels, that's just allowing more more things to uh, diffuse and get to tissues that you want to be uh, ramped up in the sympathetic response. So um, it looks like C would be the right answer. The enzymes just act by themselves. You know, I don't think they're, they're not really related to, the, to these processes, right? It's too small, it's too micro of a scale. Sympathetic is more of a macro thing, right? So 134 says, applying a drug which blocks the absorption of norepinephrine into the adrenergic nerve terminal will result in what? So just kind of a sidebar here, um, a lot of psychoactive drugs, drugs that you know, you know are bad for you, for instance, cocaine, stuff like that, are actually reuptake inhibitors. And that's exactly how they work. So they, they inhibit the reuptake of the neurotransmitter and by doing so, the neurotransmitter is more available in the synaptic cleft. So instead of 
binding to a receptor and then getting one response or a couple of controlled responses, these neurotransmitters just in the cleft and they're just, they keep firing. I think cocaine is a, is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So when you have all of these, you know, neurotransmitters that can create good feelings, euphoria, stuff like that, um, and they're just in the cleft and they're not being taken up and they're not being broken down, then you're just going to get heavy firing of those neural circuits that make you feel good. And that's exactly how the drug works. And that's one of the reasons why it's bad because you get desensitized to those uh, neurotransmitters once the drug is gone. Okay, so you get you have synaptic plasticity there. So um, we're going to kind of use that to solve this problem. So if you block absorption of norepinephrine, we're going to have more norepinephrine to respond, right? Norepinephrine is going to bind to receptors on tissues that provide a sympathetic response. So you know, it looks like very clearly that A is a correct answer, right? You're going to get increased sympathetic responses. Okay, let's do 135. The amount of norepinephrine released by sympathetic nerve terminals will be most strongly influenced by a change in which of the following. Okay, so this is kind of what I was talking about earlier uh, when I was giving the background about how uh, synaptic transduction works. So the amount of NE released by the nerve terminal. So that's the amount that the, neuro, the, the neuron itself releases, okay, is going to be influenced by what? So alpha receptor sensitivity, beta, or uh, B says alpha receptor density. Okay, so these two things are kind of distractors, okay? The question is not asking about um, how big, you know, how you can modulate the sympathetic response. It's asking about the amount of NE released, not how much of it acts, how much of it released is it released. Do you understand what I'm saying? So uh, it actually, you know, these alpha receptors, these all of these things are postsynaptic. You don't even need another neuron, another synapse. You don't even need a synapse technically for neuro norepinephrine to be released, right? All you need is those uh, presynaptic processes to occur that lead up to norepinephrine release, to neurotransmitter release. So A and B are, are out because they're, they're not necessary for release of norepinephrine. They're necessary for response to norepinephrine, and norepinephrine, but they're not necessary for its active release, right? So if you remember what we talked about earlier, we said that the way that uh, synaptic transduction works is that Beforehand, you have an action potential travels down the axon, it reaches the terminal, and then you have opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium floods in, it binds to vesicles, does, it, does its thing, and then the vesicles fuse with the membrane of the axon terminal, and bang, they release the neurotransmitter. So um, if we change the extracellular calcium, and for instance, lowered it so much so that the uh, the driving force of calcium goes in the opposite direction. So you don't even, not only that you don't have calcium going in, but you have calcium actually leaving once the voltage-gated channels open, then obviously you're not going to have vesicle fusion, right? You need that calcium within the, synap the synaptic terminal in order to have near transmitter release. So the way that these channels work essentially is that it's, for the most part, based on things going down their concentration, their electrochemical gradient, okay? So if you're changing the concentration of calcium and you make it very, 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 very low outside, then you're not going to have calcium moving in once these gates open, right? This is passive transport. Once the gates open, it's passive. So you would actually have calcium flooding out depending on how much you lower it. So if you have you know, calcium flooding out or not enough flooding in, then you're not going to get near transmitter release. Okay, so we're going to have C as our answer. All right. Based on the passage, which of the following conditions would, be, would most likely be aggravated by drugs that increase beta adrenergic receptor activity? Okay. So we're going to have to kind of go back to uh, 
what the passage was talking about, because it says based on the passage, and C, uh, what exactly is affected by the beta receptors, right? So looks like it says beta responses are increased blood glucose and dilation of blood vessels applying deep muscles and internal organs. So at face value, I don't know what kind of pathology is associated with getting more blood to muscles and internal organs. I would generally think that's a good thing. Um, but we do know pathology that's associated with blood glucose, and that would be diabetes, right? Diabetes, mellitus. So if, um, you know, we're, we're having these uh, beta responses, right, that, are, that is releasing a lot of glucose into the bloodstream, and the individual already has diabetes, um, that's going to be a big problem because you're going to have a rapid rise in blood glucose con uh, concentration. That's, that can lead to seizures and a whole host of other uh, issues. So we're going to pick diabetes. All right, last one. So if a cell's membrane potential changes from negative 60 to negative 70, so that, that would be a hyperpolarization, right? You're going away from threshold potential. After treatment with an adren adrenergic drug, the norepinephrine receptor is most likely linked to what? Okay, so this might be a little bit difficult if you haven't had a neuroscience class or if you don't remember your details um, in neurotransmission, but I think it's really important that you do go over that because they would like to test on that. So let's see. If you're changing the potential from negative 60 to negative 70, Right? So which one of these, if you have an opening, will cause hyperpolarization? Okay? So that's the best way that I can phrase this question. So out of these four choices, which one of these could lead or most likely would lead to hyperpolarization? So a move, a movement away from threshold or resting, right? So G protein it could, right? A G protein link receptor. Um, you have transduction with the G protein, but that could bind to anything. It can bind that that uh, activating subunit, right? Can activate any type of channel. So it could be one that raises the membrane potential or one that lowers it. So we can't say A because we don't know for sure. Um, same thing with adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is actually one enzyme that is activated by G proteins. So that's just actually one uh, step further down the line. So A and B are out. Um, C, a sodium channel. So if, let's say, well, usually what happens is a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor and a channel is opened, okay? So let's just assume that in a simple case, that's what's going on, okay? So if you have norepinephrine binding to a sodium channel, and sodium channels open, what happens generally, um, you know, just don't even think about norepinephrine and stuff like that. What happens generally when a sodium channel opens? Uh, you get depolarization, right? That's the beginning of the action potential. So, and that's because the driving force on sodium is going in, right, into the cell. So if you have movement of positive ions into the cell, you're going to get depolarization. So it's not C. And finally, let's look at D, a potassium channel. And we know that the second phase, the repolarization phase of the action potential is mediated by vo uh, voltage-gated potassium channels, right? Because you have uh, movement of potassium out. The driving force of potassium is out of the cell. And you have movement of positive ions out, you're going to get hyperpolarization. So we're going to pick D as your answer choice.